So our final speaker for this morning's session is Emily Platt. Um, she's a PhD candidate at Oregon State University's College of Forestry, where she is uh, studying fire ecology and modeling, federal forest policy, and federal forest restoration. And before returning to graduate school, Emily uh, served as an ex as executive director of the Gifford Pinchot Task Force, where she worked with rural community leaders, forest service leaders, and many others to build support for restoration work on national forest lands. So please welcome Emily. Well, thanks. So it's lightning round, so I'm just going to jump right into things. And um, I just wanted to give some quick background. So um, my research is part of a, an integrated social e ecological uh, project in Oregon. And I was hired to focus on fire ecology and ecological modeling. And I was pretty excited about that because I did collaborative work before graduate school and working with people as a real team, right? So I was just going to be an ecologist and answer you know, ecology questions. And what I quickly realized is that I couldn't answer my ecology questions without addressing some social issues and without using social science. So that's the part of my research I'm going to focus on today. Um, so I'm going to talk about institutional resilience of the US Forest Service. And uh, this is our project area. This is central Oregon. You can see Oregon down there. Um, and uh, most of my interviews were in the northern part of the project area up there. So uh, roughly half the land is uh, managed by federal land managers in our project area. And fire is a, is a huge issue. So I'm just going to click through these real fast. But this shows fire history in the Deschutes National Forest. This is the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and then uh, the 90s, and 2000 to 2008. So fire has really captured people's attention in the last you know, 10, 20 years in central Oregon for good reason. And my interest in, uh, in fire, and my personal interest in what these large fires mean is, uh, is, is how they affect our ability to restore these lands, what it means for disturbance, what it means for forest succession, and how we then apply that to restoration. So two of the questions I explored for the social science part of my project are, can the Forest Service create resilient forests in central Oregon with its current uh, organizational structure? And is the organizational structure of the Forest Service aligned with current management goals and objectives? So how many Forest Service people were able to make it today? No, I think you got, okay, so there's a couple. I, you know, um, I've given this presentation a couple times during the shutdown, and I'm kind of bummed because I want to hear what people think about this. But um, So I used uh, an inductive qualitative approach for this part of my research. I interviewed th uh, 38 Forest Service staff at the district headquarters, regional and national offices. You can see the types of folks I interviewed up there. I used a nested hierarchical coding scheme. These are the coding categories I used. Um, this was to basically sort the interview data. And so I'm going to refer to these codes as concepts throughout the rest of the presentation, too. So I identified prevalent concepts. And then I looked at the linkages between these concepts. And so don't worry about reading this. But what I, I just want you to see is that on the left, oh, shoot, on the left side here, these are all institutional resilience concepts. On the right side, these are landscape resilience or ecological resilience concepts. So this is just a part of my data. And it basically looks at the interactions between uh, some of the concepts uh, related to institutional landscape resilience. So I'm going to talk about um, just three key linkages um, that I think are some of the most interesting ones. And one that came up really clearly in the data is, uh, is related to planning. So um, this is planning in the sense of the National Forest Management Act, not NEPA, which we hear a lot about. But uh, the National Forest Management Act actually came up a lot more than NEPA in my interviews. And um, so that we're on the same page, so each national forest has to have a management plan, right? And these plans are basically a strategic plan for how that forest is going to be managed for the next 15 years, uh, although these plans don't get updated as often as was originally intended, so often they last a lot longer. So the forest plan was raised time and time again as an obstacle for land managers in implementing their goals related to restoration. Okay, So um, the management plans were actually linked to uh, landscape resilience through five different pathways. And I don't have time to detail those different pathways, but I can give you a general sense of it. So um, for the Deschutes and the fremont Wainema National Forest, those are the two national forests in my project area, um, the Deschutes Forest Plan and the Wainema Forest Plan were created in uh, 1990. The Fremont was created in 1989. 
And so just there's been a lot of change since then, right? Ecologically, socially, politically. And regardless of the district or the staff position, interviews, all the interviewees agreed that science, new science and information isn't represented in the current plan. And so I just want to give you a couple examples. Um, in the northern part of my research area in the Deschutes National Forest, they have these scenic management zones. And you can only, um, uh, <laughs> you can only manage in five acre chunks in these scenic management zones. You can't affect the visual quality in anything larger than five acres, right? But uh, another high priority management objective in all of these areas is to reduce fire risk, or in many of these areas, right? They're overlapping areas. And you can't really affect, you know, if you really want to affect fire behavior, you're going to want to manage in larger than five acre chunks. So this is, yeah, I know, I know it's, it's uh, right, but this was like 1989. This was a long time ago. We've learned a lot since then. So this is, you, there were so many things like this. I really had to pick just a few, but um, another one is they have these areas that, on the forest that were set aside, uh, or they, they um, let me step back. Okay, so there's areas that are set aside as reserves to be managed for sensitive species. And there's also management indicator species. And it turns out that um, some of these species are in fact quite common. And so it was very frustrating to be uh, doing special management for these species. And others are so controversial that managers have taken a hands-off approach that really, in fact, uh, makes it more likely that you're going to lose these special reserves than if you did active management in them. So the list goes on, but generally it was pretty clear that the management plan often conflicts with current management goals and objectives. And so here's a few quotes from my interviews that get at this idea. Fire doesn't recognize management area boundaries. It seems we compartmentalize the forest in ways that might be archaic to new ways of thinking. Uh, we have such a dry environment here that we're really being asked to manage stands in an unsustainable way in some of them, and that's to manage for spotted owls in particular. Uh, you focus on what you can do and where you can go, and you hope for different things on down the line. <laughs> it was, you know, uh, our existing planning doesn't do a whole lot except provide us with con constraints. So these were really typical sorts of responses that we got. And the second connection I want to talk about is uh, related to the Forest Service budget. Uh, this came up a lot, and I'm guessing that most ecologists aren't particularly interested in budget wish issues, but just you know, stick with me for a second here because it's kind of interesting. So I'm not talking about the fact that it'd be great to have more money for restoration, because it would, of course, but, uh, but this is different. So um, the Forest Service gets a budget from Congress each year, and uh, that budget is split into line items. So there's a line item for research and development, a line item for hazardous fuel reduction. Uh, you get the idea. So there's 72 line items. You're looking at just a small, a small subset of them right here. And uh, over and over again, interviewees said that the color of money, or basically the line item that Congress is putting money into, gets in the way of them meeting management objectives. And so, um, you know, the money that the Forest Service is getting from Congress, it doesn't necessarily match the needs on the ground. There's this real disconnect. And of course, um, with the government shenanigans recently, maybe that's not too surprising. Um, but it is a real problem on the ground, and it's a system that's just, it's not very responsive to changing uh, social, ecological, any other kind of change on the ground. And um, the other part of this is that it's not just there are 72 line items and it's difficult to juggle all of those things, but, uh, but Congress tends to be interested in a couple specific line items, and that's timber and hazardous fuel reduction. Um, so that's, that's what they really pay attention to, and yet the Forest Service has been very focused on restoration lately. It's in the strategic plan, it's in the new planning rule, it was a high priority objective on each of the districts where I interviewed people, and yet there's no restoration line item. So if a Forest Service manager on the ground wants to accomplish restoration, they have to be able to meet objectives for timber or for a hazardous fuel reduction or some other program they're actually being funded for. Um, so this came up so much, it was super difficult to pick uh, just a few quotes, but here's a few. So the number one driver for our treatments is timber. Uh, even though there might be high fire danger right here that really needs to be treated, if it doesn't have any valuable timber or merchable timber to pay to offset the cost of doing all this fuel stuff, then we can't. It's important, but our funding is limited, and unfortunately we rely on volume timber to dictate where we go. Hopefully we'll be able to change that. Uh, even if one district doesn't need a certain type of money, you have to send it to maintained districts because that's the money you're getting. 
And then uh, we're no longer the go-to if you want to get a lot of board feet. So I'm always fighting for money, you know, saying I'm not going to produce that much timber target, but the work we're doing is uh, extremely supported and highly popular. And that district, uh, their funding plummeted during the time I've looked at uh, data. Uh, anyway, so there's, uh, they argued for it and they got some, but, you know, definitely not as much as other districts were getting. Okay, so I'm going to, um, there's, I'm running out of time, of course, but, uh, I wanted to mention just a couple other things briefly before I wrap up. So one that's really important to me as an ecologist is that I asked managers what would happen if they got to a district and they saw some really important need on the ground. Would they actually be able to address it? Let's say they wanted to start up a, pre a prescribed fire program. And I actually kind of figured the answer would be no because of all the constraints that managers face. But um, I was completely wrong. I, I realized I was wrong within like the first three interviews. It was, you know. Surprising, but they said, uh, yeah, of course we can, but the catch is that it would take years to make it happen. So because of the budget process, it can take a couple years at best to get funding for a project, another couple years to plan it, another couple years to implement it. So I mean, at best, you're looking at four to six years to implement a project that you realize is really important. So it's not a very responsive system. And then um, the one other thing that really surprised me is that uh, ecologists and biologists were uh, by far in a way the ones who wanted the most aggressive treatments, restoration treatments. Um, they wanted the most aggressive management in general and they were uh, by far more exasperated than anyone else with the current tentative management to please whatever social or political forces they had to please to get work done on the ground. So that was really surprising to me and pretty interesting. So, um, back to the two questions. This first one, can the Forest Service create resilient forests with its current structure? I can't really answer this question just with my interview data, so I'm gonna do some ecological modeling and pair that with my interview data to, uh, to answer this question. Uh, but the second one, is the organizational structure of the Forest Service aligned with current ma management goals and objectives? Um, so I have a lot more data that I couldn't cover today, but uh, you know, um, the Forest Service has brilliant, incredible, very talented staff on the ground. And uh, their management is, they're, they're really not able to accomplish their management goals and objectives with the current system. Um, they're, of course, able to accomplish some of those things. They could accomplish a lot more of them if we removed obstacles out of their way and let them get their job done. So, um, you know, I think it, it's, uh, significant changes could be made. And, and I, you know, it might sound kind of depressing because all this stuff gets in the way and, you know, it's all this good work and we've done all this collaborative work in a lot of places in the West and so people agree, hey, this is, you know, how we want to move forward. Um, but I'm really hopeful and I'm hopeful because we do have those experts on the ground. There's amazing expertise. We're learning new things about these systems all the time. And uh, I, I think, uh, I'm not saying it won't, won't be difficult. Of course, there needs to be some political will to make these changes. but. Uh, but the solutions are there, the experts are there, and we just need to get some obstacles out of the way. So with that, hopefully I left uh, time for a few questions. Yeah, all right. Anyone? Yeah. Um, Emily, I was really struck by your comment that you know people see NFMA as such a, a roadblock. I'm wondering, you know, it sounds like we're probably eight to ten years past when the plan should have been updated. Um, and there's some people who would say that's because of the political environment, and some people would say it's because the Forest Service isn't doing its job to get ready for us. Do you have a sense of what did these people feel should be done about NFMA? Or, or you know, do they do they have some place where they perceive that the change has to happen? Yeah, that's a good question, and you know, I asked uh, my interviewees that same question, and um, they would just, uh, <laughs> you know, they've been trying to revise the regulations for the National Forest Management Act for like, I don't know what, 20 years, since 1986, something like that, and so people generally said, oh, I don't even pay attention to that, just, you know, when it gets done, it gets done, and when we start redoing our forest plan, we'll do it, and in the meantime, we'll um, create some amendments, or whatever, so we'll do it in this piecemeal sort of fashion, so, um, People didn't really have an answer to that, but I think uh, the new regulations actually are much better than the old regulations, and they, uh, if, if, uh, <laughs> if the amount of flexibility that was actually written into the regulations is utilized, then the Forest Service has a great deal of flexibility in adapting those management plans as things change uh, 
uh, over the course of the life of the plan. So um, the new regulations could definitely be really helpful, but then you know you got to get a new plan in place to be able to adopt those. So anyone else? Yep. Did your program directors or national office people have similar answers as your biologists? <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Um, well, they're so focused on different things, you know. Uh, and um, I did have personal relationships with some of the people at the Washington office, and some of them were, I think, a little wary of me. So at the regional office level, I got definitely party line answers. And at the Washington office, I got a mix of responses. So um, I would say, um, hmm. I think people are really aware of the problems that are out there. I think um, the Washington office people probably don't see the, um, the effects of all that, you know, the line item stuff, the management stuff, like all the compounding effects of these constraints on the ground. But they have, the Forest Service, you know, those people in the Washington office, they have field experience. And so um, they're aware of it. I think they're just all uh, feel really constrained by Congress and by the line item budgets they get. And there's certainly internal changes that they could make even without congressional action. So I'm not saying that, but I think it's just um, just the, a lot of stuff that's been cemented into place. And so it's just real hard to change, even though people on the ground and in DC are very aware of it. A little leadership might help, a little shake up. Yeah, yeah uh, you referred to obstacles, you know, um, to management. Um, and when I think of obstacles in forest management or, or federal land management, I think of a lot of people refer to NEPA. Uh -huh. So I'm curious as to, you know, what you think the priority obstacles are, the high priority obstacles are, and you think need to be changed or and how we might change them. Yeah. Um, well, you know, the, the budget and the National Forest Management Act actually came up most often, but NEPA did come up too. And for me, as an ecologist thinking about this, the real problem for me with NEPA is that it takes so long. And so, um, you know, there have been some new categorical exclusions that have been created for restoration work. I think the agency should make take advantage of that and make maybe a little bit more use of those categorical exclusions to make planning faster and more responsive to what they're seeing on the ground. Um, so that's, I, I know that would piss off a lot of my conservation friends and, um, you know, whatever, you know, this restoration work needs to happen and a lot of people agree on it. So I feel like we should push some of that stuff forward a little bit more even though it might be controversial and try, and, you know, have dialogues with people and bring people along and don't, you know, throw it in their face and be like, here's what we're going to do, but I don't know. So uh, NEPA did come up, a bunch of other stuff came up, but the top three were definitely the forest plan, budgeting, and NEPA. Okay. Oh, yeah. Well, you mentioned uh, forest plan amendments as kind of a way around. Um, on the Colorado Front Range that Rob was talking about, we're, we're working on the Pikes and Isabel National Forest where the forest plan there is like 30 years old. It's ridiculous. But the forest staff has a real can-do attitude about it. They just yeah. say, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll do this plan as a, you know, we'll do the CIS as a forest plan amendment. We'll fix it. And so they don't really perceive their old lousy plan as, a, as too big of a constraint. Yeah, uh, the staff on the forest where I was doing these interviews were very, um, could, eat, could definitely work around all the issues. It was just a lot of extra effort they had to put in, a lot of extra time and staff time they had to put yeah. into working around all these obstacles instead of having, having a plan that so the plan basically serves as a constraint for them instead of serving as this uh, visionary planning document about where they want to go, where they want to be in 15 years, right? And so instead of it being a support for their work, which it should be, it's a plan after all, right? It's a management plan. But instead, it provided just, you know, 20 constraints for each project or whatever. So they could certainly work around it. It was just a pain. Yeah, kind of a waste of resources. Yeah. yeah. Thank you.